Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Guillermo Ruiz. Hello everyone, on today's show we have Dr. Mark Bubbs. He's a naturopathic doctor, author, and sports nutrition lead for the Canadian men's national basketball team. He has been working with athletes and those striving to improve their health for over a decade. He is passionate that diet, movement, and lifestyle are the most powerful tools for improving health, body composition, and performance. He is the author of the book, The Paleo Project, and a regular contributor to Breaking Muscle, Paleo Magazine, Paleo Hacks, and many more. Dr. Bobs presents at health, wellness, and fitness conferences across North America and Europe. He also sees patients out of the Sports Medicine Clinic at the Toronto Athletic Club in downtown Toronto. If you enjoyed the show, check out my website, that's 3030strong.com, and leave me a review on iTunes. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Bob's here, and he's giving me an interview. So, Dr. Bob's, how are you doing? Fantastic, Guillermo. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming. Oh, you know, it's it's a nice uh, 70 degrees outside, so it's a little chilly for Arizona. <laughs> you're, you're, you're rubbing it in. My Well, my sister, li- my sister lives out in California, so I know what it's like to get the nice weather all year long in Toronto. You know, we're, we're in the we're in the dead of winter here. We got minus five outside, but bright blue skies, you know, bright blue skies. So we're all good. So, you know, I like to start my interviews with, with asking you a little bit about, about yourself. What came first? Was it paleo or naturopathic medicine? So what's your hero story? Well, I'm not sure how much of a hero story it is, but I'll tell you my story anyway. Um, growing up, uh, playing a lot of sports. I was very athletic, uh, going down the basketball, baseball route. And then, um, you know, towards the end of high school, a natural ectomorph trying to put on all this size and muscle, just pouring in. Uh, carbohydrates and dairies and all sorts of stuff and just getting sick all the time and um, that sort of led me down this path and I'm going to date myself here a little bit but that's like in the mid 90s and so at that time it was kind of like you just went to a vegan vegetarian diet and so taking out all the dairies for me was a big game changer all of a sudden I felt great Um, but that only got me up to a certain level it was still not all the way back in terms of I finished my university degree out at uh, UBC in Vancouver and decided to go traveling. I actually spent a year in Central America, so from Costa Rica, Panama, all the way up to Mexico, and uh, started eating more meat again and started to feel fantastic. Um, you know, getting up at the same time every day, going to bed about the same time every day, sun exposure every day, getting into the water. So all these things, you know, I already decided that I wanted to get into some type of medicine. I wasn't sure uh, which type. I'd originally thought uh, traditional medicine, but uh, after realizing that there's not much time in a visit to the general practitioner to really get a lot done. That's when I decided to kind of take a, you know, do some traveling and see what was out there and then started to really hit home that, you know, the, what we're eating, how we move and all these lifestyle factors, just fundamental, fundamental impacts on how well we feel and perform. You know, that's, that's very interesting because uh, you, you probably heard it before that people say, you know, I've been working out all this time and I'm trying to lose weight for a cruise or for a vacation. And I had this stubborn five pounds, and then I went to whatever destination, and I was, and all of a sudden the weight dropped off. Well, the stress is not there. You're sleeping better. You're enjoying yourself, and all of a sudden everything comes into play, and it starts working. And now you're losing your weight. So if we could apply those concepts to when we are living our everyday life. Then you know we would have a little bit better results with diet and exercise. Well, I mean, you hit on a few things there, and one of them is that uh, you know when people go on holiday, they tend to move around more. They're they're taking little trips or walking around more, and so when they're walking around more, what are they not doing? And well, they're not snacking, um, and that's one of the big you know the biggest myths that we have is this idea. If you ask the average person how to lose weight, they're going to tell you, well, I'm, I'm I think I'm supposed to eat multiple meals a day, and I've heard that that increases my metabolism and will help me to lose weight. The unfortunate fact, and I've kind of been beating on this a little bit lately, is that that's just not true, right? You read some meta-analyses, there's, there's no increase in metabolism, there's no increase uh, in acceleration of weight loss. And what happens is we actually can see an increase in body fat gain because all of a sudden we're snacking. It might start out as a nice protein and fiber snack, but all of a sudden we get a bit busy. Now it's getting to be a bit of a sweeter snack or a granola bar. Um, and it's easy to get into that caloric excess. So it's quite cool. Like you mentioned, people go on holiday, they kind of get back to three square meals. Uh, someone's doing the cooking for them. So all of a sudden they're eating real food for breakfast, uh, lunch and dinner. So, 
Yeah, getting back to basics is a big one. And I think for me, uh, for the average person, that idea of snacking and hyper palatability of foods, you know, as you would know, Dr. Stefan Guine is a real uh, yep. leader in obesity research and this idea around just how our brains are really addicted and it's tough for them to, to stray away from uh, packaged foods and things that are really palatable. You know, I have a recipe on my blog uh, for chicken salad and it should have a caution because once you start eating it, you can't stop. And, it, it, and if you take a chicken, okay, and boil it and then cut it into pieces, could you eat the whole chicken? Probably not. Could you eat two cups of mayonnaise? No, probably not. But in, if you mix those together and you add celery and then you add some bacon and then you add cranberries and the difference between the salad with and without cranberries, you put that little sweetness in there and you can't stop eating it. So this idea of food, food palatability and controlling your brain and your satiety is super, super important. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously chefs have known this for a while. That's why they have these amazing combinations. But even then in that example, I mean, it's a great example. You're dead right. And then even then you're just using cranberries and we think of all the different sweeteners and everything else and literally chemists sitting around trying to figure out what are the things that are most palatable for us. You know, it's no wonder that the poor average person who's trying to get through the day. And this is where I always joke around because clients will come in and they'll say, you know what, I've got a drawer. Don't worry. I've got a drawer full of snacks at my desk. And I think, okay, well, you know, they've done some great research. If you have snacks at your desk, the probability of you going for a snack when you're getting a bit hungry mid AM or mid PM is almost hundred percent, right? If you have to walk down the hall to the kitchen at your office, then it goes to down to about two thirds to three quarters of the time. And then if you have to get out of the building, walk two blocks over to get your snack, I mean, it goes down to like 20%. So this is where this idea of proximity and setting ourselves up for success is so important. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of workplaces, it gets sabotaged by even your coworkers because, you know, I do lots of talks downtown Toronto here, banks, law firms, and what have you. And, and, you know, people bring in muffins and cookies and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's, it's not easy for people to make the right choices when they're the, the wrong choice is so close to them, right? So we got completely out of subject. And, you know, I want to I wanna, I totally ask you uh, for, you know, because I'm trying to merge the paleo community and the naturopathic community. I think we have so much in common and we're going towards the same goals. And you talked a little bit about how uh, you, you went and traveled and, and decided to go into medicine. How did you find paleo? Yeah, sorry, we get sidetracked. Yeah. I love tangents, buddy. So that's good. You're bringing us back. That's, I like that. Um, yeah, so then after, after getting back from my travels, and this is where you know I lived a year in France and I lived in the UK and just spent some time in Asia. And so this idea of getting back to you know, a more ancestral template, reading a lot of Dr. Cordain's work, and of course, Rob Wolf's work becoming more popular, and it started to really resonate. And, and to be honest, even getting going through medical school, naturopathic medical school, it, it keeps you honest because sometimes when you're learning about herbs and supplements and various things, you naturally want to test them out and try them. But ironically, if you ask that same doctor or student, get, name me the top two foods in that nutrient, you often get a blank stare. And so this is where it says, wait a minute, we've got to really off the top of our heads be knowing the foods that are rich in these things on someone's protocol if you're a young naturopath. Um, you know, or even an experienced naturopath, you see this all the time, or functional doc, what have you, you know, it's, it's fine to have some supplements as a stopgap, but what is the solution in the long term? If they have low iron, sure, we can give them an iron supplement, but when we start looking at which foods have the most, you know, for this example, micronutrient density, all of a sudden we keep landing on the same foods, and those foods tend to be the ones that are in this kind of ancestral uh, paleo template, again, with some exceptions of, of really personalization rather than following a strict uh, regime for everyone. So you were vegan for a while? Yeah, I was vegan in the late 90s. Yeah, early, like 2000. Uh, you know, I can see how any diet, going from a standard American diet or a standard Canadian diet, and then moving into any type of restrictive diet will probably give you good results. Maybe, you know, you're st you, you are going away from eating processed foods. You're limiting your sugar intake. But uh, what about athletes have you had any trouble you know you work with athletes have you had any trouble with uh, people that were vegan and they want to perform in a, at an olympic level well i mean the, the big thing is i try not to use any kind of uh, labels on anything everything's a tool and if you think of everything as a tool then all you're doing when you have a, an athlete or a client in front of you is trying to figure out you know what are the gaps where where are the needs for this person and if the need happens to be iron and we want to get more iron rich foods and they happen to be animal based and that would be the first line therapy now if you have someone who's a vegan vegetarian then maybe that's not an option for them however you know some people are vegan vegetarian for uh, environmental or animal rights or religious reasons others are because they think it's making them healthier 
And so there's a big, you know, sometimes if the, if the diet is making you unhealthy or you're not as healthy as you could be, this is where this idea of personalization, you know, what if somebody who's on a vegan diet who does eat some meat once in a while or vice versa, somebody on a paleo diet who have, having some various grains that might work well for them. It, it's, it's finding that last 10 or 15 percent. And so with athletes, it's really just about, uh, again, the ancestral approach really helps to just bring it back to really getting the foods in that are going to pack a lot of the, uh, the micronutrient punch that we need. And then, you know, after that, you know, carbohydrate intake becomes the more elite you get, you know, when you're working at high intensity, carbohydrate intake does become important. You know, there's, there's small areas where ketogenic approaches can be helpful for some, but more just in terms of portions of their training if they're really, really at an elite level because we, we don't have enough evidence yet for uh, as, as a, a full stop approach for, for really high performance. And even with, uh, with athletic performance, you know, the diet for that athlete is going to change whether they're in season or out of season. Well, that's just it. I mean, this idea, any athlete will tell you they change their training uh, day to day, week to week, month to month. They periodize their training. But one of the big gaps we have, and this is even with uh, medical nutrition staffs, is we tend to eat the same thing regardless of what phase we're in. So this is a, you know, in the last five years, this has really come on in terms of this idea of nutritional periodization of you know, if I'm doing very light work, if I'm having a rest day, then my nutritional intake will change perhaps. And, you know, carbohydrates are kind of the simplest way of thinking about that, uh, of reducing or increasing the amounts. And if you have it, if you're training uh, intensely and performing two a days and it's training camp, whether you're a football player, or basketball player, et cetera, then yeah, we definitely need to get more calories in. We need to get the re required amount of carbohydrates in. And so having a you know, that frame of reference is pretty nice because when, when athletes get injured, they often start to undereat because they're not moving anymore. They often undereat protein, which is really important for uh, repair in terms of uh, recovering from injury. So this is where, you know, laying in these sort of habits and themes really helps athletes because they can then start to, to drive the right behaviors versus always having to wait for the coach or clinician to be over their shoulder, you know, telling them what to do in terms of a plan. You hit a point, you know, with protein. You know, we think, oh, protein, you know, we need to build muscle. But protein is in charge of so many things. Detoxification. Uh, there, it's it's a building block for so many uh, pathways in our in in our physiology. What is you know? There's a lot of controversy on, on how much protein you need per day. W what are your parameters when it comes to protein and athletes? Yeah, I mean, there's this is where context really matters, and I think this is where people struggle because you'll read an article and it will be, an uh, perhaps an endurance athlete or a strength athlete or a regular Joe, let's say. Uh, and we start to mix and match the different requirements, and, th and that's where some confusion starts in. So protein requirements for athletes, I mean, getting up to like 2.3 grams per kilogram or just over a gram per pound is definitely a, f a floor that we we want to achieve. Um, a floor? Not A floor, yeah. Wow. I mean, the ceiling, when I mean, we look at research from Jose Antonio out at the International Society of Sport Nutritionists, I mean, they've done work with three grams per kilogram over the course of a year, and there's no adverse effects on kidney function. So it really depends on the type of athlete they're working with. Do they require to be a certain body composition? Because if they do, then we do want to get protein up to a certain amount, even upwards of 2.4 grams or more, because we can use that whilst in a caloric restriction to maintain lean muscle mass. So again, you know, it comes back to the sort of needs analysis, but depending on which type of athlete, endurance versus strength even, will we'll dictate that. And for the average person, I think the, it gets a little confusing because there is a wider gap in terms of the amounts of protein we, we truly need. But then it becomes a question of if the person who's trying to lose weight is going to eat something, well, then protein's a pretty darn good bet because it does help to increase metabolism. It does help to increase satiety. It's virtually impossible to convert into body fat. Um, you know, we've got studies of bodybuilders consuming 4.4 grams per kilo, which is, you know, they have bodybuilders dropping out of the study because they couldn't eat that much protein. I mean, that tells you how much protein it was. And there's, there's virtually no increases in fat mass. So I think for the average person now with so much information on the internet, it, this is where clinicians and experts and naturopaths and nutritionists and trainers can really help out to, to titrate the information and tailor it because it's it's a bit like the telephone game now where someone reads an article and then by the time they they, re they recite that information to somebody else, there's something that gets lost in translation. So I think that's where we got to be really uh, sharp with tailoring exactly what that individual needs. And then at the same time, you know, as humans, we have biases and and you know, like we would we can hear something, someone talk, or there's an article talking about, uh, oh, this methylating factors will help you become a better methylator. But that's a U-shaped curve, you know. So then if you in over-increase your methylation, if you uh, – now you're, you're putting yourself at a cancer risk. And it's probably as bad as being under-methylating. 
I mean, you nail it in terms of like when you look at various doctors or researchers who are into various fields of whether it's endurance sport or strength sport or whether it's a doctor who uh, had a sleep issue when they were younger or an autoimmune condition, we, we, we view life through our own lens. Um, and I think that's where it's a nice job to kind of hang out with different groups of people. You mentioned like the ancestral paleo group community, uh, the naturopathic community, the traditional medical community, dietitians, nutritionists, strength coaches. Like you get a different viewpoint every time you start to hang out with different groups of health practitioners. And I think that's helpful because sometimes, like you mentioned, you do, we don't realize the bias that we're in when the first thing that comes up to one clinician's head is methylation, whereas for another person it might just be, well, that person's not eating enough uh, protein or calories or whatnot, right? So it's uh, – Again, and it doesn't mean one approach is, is worse than the other, but I think when we can open our eyes a little bit and really just have that needs assessment of what is actually going on here, uh, that really helps to nail down just a lot of the low-hanging fruit for me as a clinician is the big thing. What are the easy things that are habits that people can build in very easily that have the biggest bang for our buck? You, you might have a gold standard approach that's further down the line, but if you can just drip feed a few things in, get people feeling better, because uh, the buy-in and the relationship is just a huge part of medicine. It's a huge part of of nutrition and building habits. So what are your biggest needle movers? What are the things that you say, okay, we'll start here because no matter what I do with supplementation, with periodization, if you don't have these basics, those needles are not going to move. Well, for me, it's all about, I mean, it's all about starting small and starting at the, the start of the day. So people get up. So the first indication will be, you know, I'll, I'll give them something to eat at breakfast and a mid AM snack or take the mid AM snack away. But I'm going to break the day into thirds and start with just breakfast and snack am and give them a let's for example let's say it's a weight loss client right we've got almost three quarters of the population that are overweight or obese we've got one out of two pre-diabetic or diabetic so the chances are somebody coming into your office are going to be struggling with these issues and start small just make them change their breakfast if they're snacking in the mid-morning make them take out their snack uh, replace it with things that help to suppress appetite like a coffee or a tea and this might seem like, you know, especially when we're starting out, people want to give out a lot of information or you see this all the time in personal training. We prescribe all these, uh, you know, eight or ten things. But if you if you push a client beyond their capacity, they're not going to take in the, the suggestions or they will follow your 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 approach, your your handout for a month. But when life gets busy, they'll go back to their own habits. Right. Um, and so this has been really helpful for me because what you'll notice is the clients who start to change their breakfast Maybe they come in two weeks later and all of a sudden they've changed their lunch. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't tell them to change their lunch. They decided to change their lunch. So already we have now this gives me information on whether they're extrinsically motivated by, by a coach or a doc or whatnot or intrinsically motivated, right? So you're going to see differences with clients who come in who have changed other things versus the ones who just changed their breakfast and are still leaning on the other meals of the day. So this kind of stepwise and drip feed fashion because I – really drive home a lot of the, uh, for me, you know, diet, movement, lifestyle factors are kind of the key. I found that's the best way to actually build habits in people so that months and months down the road, they almost don't even remember what they did that was different because it's all just built into their lifestyle now. They can't even remember what they changed, right? That's the perfect scenario. And and those are the people that are going to start talking to their friends and they're going to become like that honeymoon phase of whatever label you want to put it, you know, and they're going to be telling their friends, hey, guess what? You know, I started doing this and I cut this and and they become uh, more motivated to continue those habits. For sure. And the average person who's busy and has work commitments and family commitments, I mean, they want things to be doable. They want to do the least amount of effort to get the most amount of benefit because it's tough to commit lots of time to things when you've got all these other um, demands in your life. And so I think that's where, you know, I've noticed that people really are, are amazed. I mean, I had a one lady come in in May. She was, uh, you know, upwards of 270 pounds at almost six feet tall. And then by November, she's 223 pounds and, uh, you know, completely changing her life and energy levels and relationships and you know, if you asked her how hard it was, she'd say, hey, it was a lot easier than I thought. And so just getting that right information, the right cues, and it's not always easy. You know, we always, you know, some clients are going to be better than others and some clients are going to need more support than others. But for me, that's the, uh, that's really the, the theme and the, uh, the mentality. Could you tell us how you got involved with the Canadian national basketball team? Yeah, I mean, my background growing up was basketball, so it was really fun to – I was working uh, at a clinic and uh, head therapist for the team had been working there. My background in strength and conditioning as well, so I started out doing some work with our, our younger athletes on the uh, rehabilitative uh, side of things, uh, movement rehab. And then that led into doing some nutritional work and just overall sports, quite an integrated approach. Uh, and from there, just led into to, to my role as the uh, – the, the nutrition lead and now, you know, working with our Olympic athletes, national team, all the way down to we're building the program from the 13 year olds on up. So now start layering in those habits, just like I mentioned, when they're 13, 14, 15, then when they get to 20, 21, 22, it's, uh, it's all 
a heck of a lot easier, right? In terms of it's just stuff that they already do. So taking that long-term macro view of things is really, uh, really helpful for trying to build a program. And, uh, you know, I was, I had a conversation with Daryl Edwards and, uh, we were talking about how a percentage of the kids who are doing the, you know, the peewee leagues or, you know, a very small percentage are actually going to transition and become the Steve Nash's of the world. For sure. But, but, you know, when we see these people, these athletes, and they are, they, this discipline that comes with, with play, this, uh, all of these habits that you're forming, we have two choices. We can train like an elite athlete, even if you're not going to become elite, but we forget to eat like an elite athlete. So what does the conversation look like when you're talking to like a mom who is asking you for advice for their kids, you know, because I think the last thing they think, you know, is I got to put my kid on a paleo diet or they might have this uh, that their kid is kind of a, of a picky eater. So how do you broach that subject? Well, I mean, these different people come to me. I mean, they're, 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 they're pretty much bought in or they're part of the program. So it's not so much uh, trying to convince them. It's 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 more I'm actually frankly I'm amazed. I mean, when I was 13, 14 playing basketball, I did not think about these things and was, you know, the diet I was consuming would be shocking compared to I just did a talk for our 13, 14 year olds and I tell you the knowledge base on, you know, kale and various and animal proteins and sugar. I mean, I was blown away. So it's it's amazing how, you know, with connectivity and things like this and uh you know, we're shifting the needle in terms of people's belief systems, but it's still this idea of layering in. You know, if you're an athlete, then getting to eat five or six meals a day now is a good idea because it really is 24 hours a day. This idea of a, a real anabolic window directly after training, you know, we can argue one way or the other, but at the end of the day, everyone will agree it's, you know, 24 hours a day once you start training at intensity is key. So how much protein do you eat over the course of the day? Are you achieving your caloric intake? And so that's where having these multiple meals uh, is really important because, I mean, I was just the other day up the, the uh, Institute National, the Sport National Institute in Montreal with the gymnastics uh, trampoline team that I work with. And again, it's, it's, it's tricky for athletes who are busy and have to go to school, right? Sometimes they miss breakfast. Sometimes they have a coffee. They're not as hungry. So again, it gets back to this idea of just building habits. Uh, and for the more elite, we get more specific with what we want to put into those habits. So this idea of like, okay, five or six meals a day, at least 20 grams of protein per meal. And the more general or there's more someone starting out, then it's just the bigger themes of, okay, get some protein in at breakfast, get some fats in. If you're overweight, let's pull some of those carbohydrates down. You know, I always, I always try to keep the instructions as few as I can. How, how little words do I have to say? How few words do I have to say to give an instruction? Because then it's, it's much harder to, uh, to misconstrue, right? So keep it straightforward, keep it simple, and you'll be amazed at how the, the outcomes that you can get with very little effort. Well, you know, and, and athletes are used to coaching, so they, you know, they're gonna be better equipped to follow your instructions. For sure, for sure. So now, uh, with the national basketball team, uh, you know, when you guys when you travel, when uh, how do you deal with time zone changes, and and what are some of the recommendations that you have for your athletes, or is that something that is given to someone else since your nutrition? So no, so we don't work like, unlike a lot of even high level teams, we don't work in silos. So the, I'm not stuck in one end working my nutrition, whereas the strength and conditioning is doing his thing, and the medical is doing theirs, and the ATs. You know, we're all communicating, and the things that impact nutrition are the same things that are going to impact soft tissue support the same things gonna impact performance on the in the gym and on the court so you know travel is a big one we get together in the summer times and the trips are typically long distance trips we just went over to Asia last year for the qualifier so you know without giving you too much of the secret sauce in terms of what we <laughs> what, what we do for, for travel but things like circadian rhythms are, are really big you know helping us to set and maintain new circadian rhythms with the guys in terms of using you know blue light as a proxy for sun or, or blocking thereof uh, as a way to help them get on to new time zones is really key even around food timing once they get to destinations uh, and even more importantly than that you know guys get used to eating certain things and when we get to new destinations we're, we're um, phoning ahead and and all the back-end work that goes into making sure there's certain options available uh, because getting a gi bug let's say when you travel you know getting a that type of thing can you know you lose a player to a gi issue uh, it's not uncommon when you go to some of these tournaments and depending on the player you lose, it's a big, especially in a game like basketball where one player makes a big impact on the team then that becomes, so there's some prophylactic things that we can use there as well. But, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it just comes back to getting the guys on the, on a, back on a routine as quick as we can. Cause they all do better once they're on a routine. Hmm. 
Wow. And, and you know, and, and that goes into, you know, appropriate supplementation and appropriate training and appropriate, you know, the training when you're traveling is probably much, very different than when you're just uh, off season or even playing in, in your country. Yeah, we use a, a varying degree of different uh, analytics to help us tell whether, how the guys are doing in terms of nervous system and recovery. So that definitely plays into it in terms of programming, uh, practice time and intensity, et cetera, not only when we're in camp, um, but also uh, on the road for sure. And, and that dovetails into, you know, what you're going to feed someone in terms of nutrition, et cetera, with trying to support that, right? You know, it sounds like, you know, being a naturopath really came in handy when uh, for doing something like this when you're with so many different professions, you know. Uh, how do you deal with something like pain management? Yeah, I mean, this is something that um, – you know, in clinical practice, you see all the time. I mean, I always joke around. I've got a three-year-old at home. I go to daycare. Every single three-year-old's got a perfect squad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm looking for the personal trainers or the strength coaches in the daycare. I don't see any. So how come everyone moves perfectly when we're infants and toddlers? And then all of a sudden, by the time we're 20, 30, 40, 50, 20% of the population moves the right way. Um, and so movement dysfunction for me is a huge one. I mean, I think pain is just a signal. Pain is just a sign your, your brain is giving you that something's dysfunctional. And I think a lot of times in traditional setting we just we we mask pain or we you know we, we eliminate pain but we don't get to why the pain's there in the first place and of course you know the real experts in pain will tell you we don't really know pain i mean there's so many different reasons why we can have pain and the way that pain expresses itself um but i think that when i work having had the chance and the fortune to the good fortune of working with some real uh elite elite level uh therapists and practitioners they all have systems Right? They all have these baseline systems where they can set a standard and then progress someone through a system with progressions and lateralizations in order to, to move them toward better movement, uh, amongst other things, if it has to be you know, actual therapy-based. But that's, a, I think, a real important thing for, for practitioners who work on the pain side uh, to have incorporated. And, of course, as, you know, as, as docs, we have a lot of nice tools at our disposal in terms of you know, anti-inflammatories. Um, things like even sleep, sleep deprivation will, will worsen pain syndrome. So, you know, using the, the, the integrative uh, approaches as well as movement based and then applying, you know, there's times for when you need medication. There's times when, you know, if you're at the elite level, you know, cortisone shots are there for a reason. But if we, if we, if we just, if we're taking those prophylactically or, or just as after every single session, then, then that's when we know that we're just, uh, you know, treating the uh, symptoms and not really the root cause. Well, uh, just yesterday, I was reading a paper on the new recommendations for chronic pain uh, or acute pain, and no longer are opiates first choice. They are actually recommending yoga, exercise, and acupuncture. And how powerful wow. is that? <laughs> it's pretty. It's, it's funny because I imagine you went back like a thousand years, and we would have bought the same three recommendations, right? Yeah, we've come a long, <laughs> we've, we've, we've come a long way. We've, yeah, it's it's like you know what it, what's old becomes new again. It's the it's the full circle, right? And that's uh, it's amazing how once you, yeah, working with movement and really getting when people get a sense of how they move and what muscles are 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 doing what in the body, and yeah, if you have a practitioner who knows acupuncture well, it's, it's phenomenal. You can really do a lot of things around, uh, and I think when clients have a sense that they have a role to play in pain, pain's not just something that's happening to them, but they have, uh, um, they can have a, a role in helping to reduce it or find the triggers, that's a really big home run, because the ones who feel like they're just at the mercy of pain, that's when you start to see, it's, it's amazing how the brain's involved, you start to see the pain worsening in terms of the intensity and even the frequency, right? Uh, you know, uh, Keith Norris uh, told me that he believes that we are primary, primarily we are movers and we are upper opportunistic eaters. So, you For know, sure. and, and we usually, you know, immediately go to diet, you know, it, it, because it, I guess it, it's because something we can do or we can affect. But having good movement is so important for pain. Absolutely. I mean, we get stuck in pattern. I mean, we sit all day now and we all these things that are just not inherently uh, natural. And just if you imagine even the blood sugar dysfunctions we see in that glycation in terms of this, this just the, how tissue works. I mean, that's a, you know, if you can get somebody's blood sugars and insulin back into balance, you all of a sudden you notice movement and discomfort and all sorts of things can improve too, right? So you're, you're, you're right on. I want to ask you a personal question. What, what does your day like, look like food-wise? Like morning, you know, your three meals and maybe snacks? Well, I mean, it changes from day to day. It depends on sort of what I'm doing. So, you know, a lot of early days starting in clinic um, with little ones at home, I'll often just get up, uh, have some bone broth and collagen out the door, um, get a coffee in when I'm in clinic, and then, you know, work through the morning, a little bit intermittent fasting style, and have a, uh, a breakfast and kind of mid to late morning, you know, some eggs, 
perhaps a little bit of bacon, uh, veggies, lettuce, tomato, etc. Uh, and then days when I'm training, there'll be a little bit more carbohydrates in there as well. If I'm if I'm lifting, then you know oats are a, a go to for me. They work well. Uh, no. Wait no, a minute, that's no not dysfunction. paleo. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's, there's no there's no paleo police. That's that's fine. It's it's all about individualization. So this is important for people to put their finger on. Um, but things like plantains and whatnot are great too. And I'll do. Uh, a lot of different root veg, but again, around time prep and having a couple of young kids around the house, and it's just a, a matter of uh, finding things that work for you and always just remembering it in terms of foods, you know, digestive dysfunction, immune dysfunction, you know, if, if foods don't inherently cause these issues in people, then we got to, you know, if they're appropriate, then I'm okay with someone being a certain percentage ancestral or paleo and a certain percentage not, right, in terms of this, in terms of being an absolutist. Hey, I'm, I'm 100% paleo 80% of the time. Love it, love it, perfect. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, and we, we, we can look at food as technology. You know, if someone has low glutathione levels, you can do some whey protein and that's going to increase your glutathione levels. Uh, the argument of, oh, we are the only mammal that drinks another mammal's milk. We are the only mammal that wears pants. So should we stop <laughs> yeah. wearing pants? I've, based on that argument, it sounds like yes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe uh, we'll just let it hang out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, – and again, when you go back to a lot of the, just the need for various nutrients and you just go back to what foods they're in, I mean it, it guides you into the realm of animal proteins and all these wonderful fats and vegetables and some fruit, modest amounts of fruit. And you know, if you're starting from that platform, then – whether the person adds a certain amount of starchy carb or not is really just dependent on um, their activity level, their uh, perhaps a little bit of their genetics, et cetera. But for sure, I think that's a great uh, – people have to watch with their frames of reference, right? And, and, and also their autoimmune level. You know, A person that has some level of autoimmunity is not going to have the same latitude that, that an athlete, You know, that someone that is at peak performance. Eventually, you might get into that level where you're probably going to be able to tolerate some oats maybe a slice of pizza every once in a while, but if you, you have someone with like overt autoimmunity, maybe for, for the time being, you, you're just going to have to be tight with your diet. Oh, absolutely. And that's to get back to this whole idea of context. And people will generally flip their context from sentence to sentence. And that's where as soon as they change the context and the rules change. And even when you work with high intense you know, elite athletes, there's a lot of, especially endurance athletes, there's a lot of damage to the gut. So there's actually a greater likelihood of things like leaky gut with endurance athletes. So as you mentioned, things like low grade autoimmune conditions are much more common than you think and often don't get flagged. And so that's one for clinicians to look out for because now all of a sudden, just as you said, now there's an indication for that athlete to say, you know what? We shouldn't be having bread or a sandwich at lunchtime. We got to start replacing that, um, you know, with some yams or plantains or root veg or whatever it might be. That, that, that's where that individualization becomes really, really key. Now, uh, do you do you ever deal with, you know, you you're dealing with type A personalities and athletes? Do you ever deal with orthorexia? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't. Um, I wouldn't say I've dealt with severe cases. Um, but I think as a society, we're perhaps being pulled in that direction. I think a lot of the subliminal things, just like as a society, if you're just going with the flow and eating what's around you, you're going to tend to be pulled into this pre-diabetic, overweight, increased likelihood of anxiety and depression state without even realizing it just because those are the things that are around us. And I think that's perhaps similar with you know social media and the postings of, um, of pictures, et cetera. So I definitely think it's – as clinicians, it's important to kind of see how people react to various foods or if there are spheres around adding in various foods or this is why this idea of even when we get on restrictive diets, if a person's only eating five different foods for extended periods of time, I mean, I think we've got to watch out for various cues of, of that type of um, behavior because I don't think it's in the end therapeutic. Even when people initially get benefit, I think there's still more to the story in terms of what the root cause is. You know, just as if you would get benefit from a low carb diet with a dysbiotic patient who's overweight, but at some point there needs to be an addition of, of more variety and fiber types to help support that microbiome. So it's it's again back to just using the right tool. And and that's why we need to rely on uh, on the doctors, not on Doctor Google, to give us this advice. For sure, and I think that's where you know it's nice. The one great thing about functional medicine or naturopathic medicine or whatever you might say is just that they're sort of you know they're they're hand in hand with the patient or client along the journey, right? And it is a journey. If people are if it takes you 10 years to have a condition, then it's it's always nice if a clinician can completely reverse that in a one visit. But I mean, it takes time, and it's a it's a it's a journey, and it's a 
uh, it's a more of a coach type relationship. And I think that's where people, it motivates people and people realize that they're being supported and cared for. And that's a huge part of the process. And I think that's one where in, in traditional medicine, we just totally miss out on that, um, you know, in, in 10 minute visits, 15 minute visits. And we end up costing the system a heck of a lot more because we just let disease conditions go from pre-diabetic all the way into diabetes when, when we can see it coming from a mile away, yet we do nothing until a full dysfunction has taken root. You know, I'm at the Southwest College of Nature Biology Medicine, and I got a couple of months before I graduate, but I am seeing uh, uh, patients under the supervision of attending physician. And uh, I, had a, I had a patient that came into the clinic uh, with depression. And, you know, we started the basics and we tried, you know, we tried to remove things like uh, gluten and stuff like that. Came for, back for the follow-up and the patient said, you know, I never disclosed that I had colitis because my doctor told me that that was a condition that I was going to have to live with for the rest of my life. But ever since I changed my diet, the colitis has disappeared. And that was so amazing. And it took just going from that five-minute visit to a more complete visit and understanding what was going on. For sure. And I think that's where even as clinicians setting these limitations on people, you know, I'm sure there, you know, there's definitely conditions where perhaps it's appropriate, but this idea of telling someone they're going to be on a medication forever or they're going to have a condition forever and that they're again, just the victim of this condition rather than trying to figure out like why did this condition happen in the first place? What is going on? I think that's what we miss. You know, unfortunately in, in traditional medicine, it's phenomenal acute care. You know, you get hit by a bus or you break your arm. I mean, it's, uh, that's what so that's what we want, but yeah, unfortunately, don't, don't, don't take me to uh, to the nature path. Take me to the emergency I, I department. I, I don't want a chamomile poultice at that point. <laughs> um, but you know, it just it's almost like we're so enamored with what we can do from a technology and surgery standpoint that we just miss all this low hanging fruit where we can actually, you know, we spend so much money. I mean, the systems are a little bit different, obviously, but in Canada, fifty cents of every tax dollar goes to the healthcare system, and we just you know we're waiting for people to get sick and then trying to fix them. So it's. Um, you know, it's, it's not a very cost effective approach. It's worse over here when we have this fake economy where you're paying into something that has no, no, uh, advertised value. So you don't know what you're paying for and the money is back, you know, changed, it changing hands in the, in, in, in the back rooms. And, uh, I really am a big proponent of a cash based model where you are paying for something and they are, you are receiving that benefit. It might seem more costly up front, but I'd rather pay my cost up front than 15, 20 years down the line at a hospital. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough question. I, I, I totally agree that the, it's great for patients to know and it drives the cost down because I mean, there's supposed to be competition, especially in the, um, the U S and there isn't, I mean, there's, you know, my sister lives in LA. There's, there's procedures there that have cost her in the order of 20 to 30 fold more than what it costs here in Canada. And so why is that if there's competition? So I think you, you're very right in that. You know, it's a complicated situation, but there should be ways of, uh, of streamlining that because, you know, helping people out and getting those end results is really what the, the bottom line is. Dr. Bobbs, how can, how can people get in contact with you? How, you know, uh, are you going to be at any conferences or any speaking engagements? Yeah, they can check out my website, drbubs.com, um, and the, my book, The Paleo Project, paleoprojectbook.com. I've got my list of speaking engagements on there. Um, and of course, if your readers will, will, will send you over a link there, I've got a free ebook. It's a two week plan called the kickstart plan to help people get back on the straight and narrow in terms of, you know, diet, exercise, lifestyle. And so they can click on the link there and, uh, and jump into some of that. But, uh, yeah, I'll be out in London though, in the UK in June. So I think, uh, are you going to be out there as well, Guillermo? I think we'll see you out there. So I got accepted to, uh, to ICNM. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I got accepted with a, with a poster presentation but I don't know if I'm going to be able to swing it because, you know, I'm about to graduate and I got to go interview. Yeah, it's not, yeah. it's not for sure. Well, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll be out there. We'll send some tweets. Uh, you know, last year, were you in Barcelona? I was supposed to be out in Barcelona, but my daughter was born on exactly oh, the same man. day. So I was, uh, I had to cancel last minute, unfortunately. So there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of drama there, but uh, they, uh, they got it all covered up. So yeah, I got, I got, I was at Barcelona last year. Are you going to be at Paleo Effects? Uh, I may be at Paleo Effects. I'm trying to look at my schedule. Uh, I've got some some conferences coming up, so hopefully be able to get down there uh, this year because May and June's pretty pretty busy. But uh, that'd be great. Yeah, always a great time at Paleo Effects. And then uh, AHS and uh, later in the year. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving me this interview. Uh, you know, go. Uh, oh, your podcast. Would you, Would you like to talk about your podcast? Absolutely. Yeah, we got Dr. Bob's Performance Podcast. You know, great lineup of guests, PhDs, experts, and. Functional medicine, nutrition, fitness—people we work with in terms of the Olympic uh, medical teams—and and 
whole host of experts. So yeah, definitely check that out right on my website, drbubs.com. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the interview. I'll talk to you later. Awesome. Appreciate it, Guillermo. Thanks a lot, bud.